Well, thanks. Uh, many thanks to the, the organizers for this chance to talk. And it's always a pleasure to, of course, be in, in Trieste. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, diffusion. Um, right, diffusion. OK. So, but before I start, uh, I want to give a few. This is going to be mostly a sort of theoretical talk concerned with some theoretical problems. But I want to spend a moment uh, grounding it in, in uh, experimental facts first. So, so some preliminary big picture questions that this talk is related to are the following three. They're going to be three. So one is, uh, so bad metals are metals that have, whoop, uh, that have conductivities well above the Mott-Joffrey Regal limit, maybe you know, 200 or 300 microns centimeter. And so here are a couple of cuprates. Here is VO2. These are going up to very high, very high temperatures, and the resistivity just, just keep, keeps going up. It's, it's been argued often that transport with such a high resistivity uh, is not compatible with a simple uh, quasi-particle picture. And if that's the case, one would like to know what is the physical mechanism, what replaces the Druda formula uh, for these for, for bad metals, so transport above the module of a regular limit. Okay. Another question uh, you might like to ask is why is T linear resistivity so so widespread? So the, I won't go into these plots in details, but we have uh, cuprates, nictides, uh, organics, heavy fermions, uh, strontium ruthenate, and these, these bits in the middle of the phase diagram, uh, by definition they're in the middle, uh, are all showing uh, T-linear resistivity. And furthermore, many properties, as maybe we'll hear more uh, later today, many of the properties of these T-linear resistivities, such as the, the scattering rate that you might extract, are rather similar across these quite different compounds, where you might expect the microscopic scattering mechanisms to be uh, different. Okay, that's another, another question. And finally, uh, as I just mentioned, in fact, not only does so a T linear sort of resistivity does not have units of, of time, okay, or inverse time. And so if you want to associate a rate to, to, to uh, a resistivity, you have to do some more work. Uh, the best thing maybe is to measure an optical conductivity and look at the width of the Judah peak, for example. Uh, and so it's a fact that many of these T-linear resistivities are associated with what's sometimes called uh, a Planckian scattering rate set by KBT over H-bar with just order one, a number like one or two in front of it. So there's sort of a universal scattering rate that seems to appear in many different compounds. That's what this plot is showing in a rather non-intuitive uh, way. Uh, and these are old plots about, this is the self-energy showing scaling uh, omega over t, and this is an optical conductivity also showing an omega over t scaling, but there are many, uh, many experimental instances that the t-linear resistivity in many of these materials is associated with the uh, h-bar over kbt time scale. Okay, and you could ask where is this universe, why, why is this time scale appearing uh, in so many different places? And furthermore, uh, even if you know, you're going to grant yourself maybe quantum criticality or something to explain this scale, it's not at all obvious why this time scale should determine the resistivity. Of course, in the Judah formula, the resistivity is set by a time scale, but the Judah formula may not be valid for these systems, okay? Because they may not be quasi-particle systems. So, right. so even if you grant yourself this time scale, why, why does it determine the resistivity? So those are three uh, big questions that we're, we're not gonna answer, but they're gonna motivate what, what we're about to do. Uh, so the objective for today uh, is to uh, establish results on transport, theoretical results that relate to these questions. And I want to set some rules, okay, uh, for myself, which I have not generally followed in the past. Uh, I'd like to really prove something, okay, uh, and by which I mean I don't want to make any uncontrolled approximations, and I also don't want to use Boltzmann theory slash quasi-particles, which I have nothing against Boltzmann theory, but it, it's conceivable that it doesn't apply to some of these materials. So I'd like to set myself the goal of showing what can you prove without assuming quasi-particles and more generality, okay? And secondly, I'd like to be as realistic as possible, which in this case means I don't want to do large N, things like that. I don't want to have infinite coordination number as in, as in DMFT. And, and so, because both of these things fundamentally change the nature of scattering. For example, large N tends to add a bath that you can scatter things into, and, and that really changes the, the nature of the calculation and the results, okay? Right, so I don't want to use Boltzmann theory, I don't want to do large N, so, so what, 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 uh, what, what can we do? Okay, so I'm going to do two things. So the first thing is going to be, uh, I'm going to argue for a bound on, on diffusion. 
uh, in fact, have talked about several bounds over the years, um, but uh, I really want to try to prove something. Okay, so this is not going to be a conjectured bound, it's going to be a proven bound. And we had a physical argument actually over a year ago, and more recently, uh, we've actually managed to prove this bound on diffusivity uh, within a re more, res more restricted context that I'll come to. And so I'm, I'm very fond of bounds because if, I, if, I, if you want to throw away a lot of the machinery that we're used to, you don't really have much left. And it may be very difficult. It may be too much to ask to be able to calculate the resistivity. But putting bounds on things is a little bit easier. And you could ask, well, how does quantum statistical mechanics constrain transport? Okay, what, what can you just show? And of course, the fact that so many different materials behave in a similar way, one way that can happen is that they're all sat pushing up against some kind of bound. Okay, so I'm, I'm fond of bounds and we'll try to prove something. And, and secondly, if I have time, I'd also like to discuss uh, diffusion in a particular sort of quasi-solvable model uh, that we considered recently. All right, so be, these are the two parts of the talk. So let's talk about bounds. Okay, so this is, this is a, again, there are many different bounds that I've talked about at various points. Um, this is probably not the same bound that may come up later uh, in other people's talks. Okay. And, and so this is a bound related to causality. And again, so first I'm going to give a heuristic argument uh, that we came up with about a year ago uh, with Tom Hartman, who's at Cornell, and my ex-student, uh, Raghu, who's now at Princeton. OK, so before I do that, let me say something about hydrodynamics. And so I'm going to mean hydrodynamics here in a, in a weaker sense than what uh, Cameron was just telling us about a few minutes ago. So a strong sense of hydrodynamics is that it's the theory of water, and that means the Navier-Stokes equation, and, and so on. Okay. A weaker sense of hydrodynamics means it's the collective dynamics that describes the approach to equilibrium. Okay. After all the microscopic stuff has decayed, what you're left with is hydrodynamics. And, so in, and in the simplest case, that could just be diffusion, for example. Okay. So I'm going to call diffusion a hydrodynamic equation. Okay. Some people, just to, to fix what I mean, I, I include diffusion. So let me say this. So Conserved densities are special because the total charge is conserved, and that constrains. So if the total charge is conserved, then that constrains a very long wavelength fluctuation of the charge, okay? Because in the limit where the wavelength goes to infinity, that's, that's the whole charge, and that cannot change as a function of time. And so by continuity, very long wavelength fluctuations of charge have to change slowly with time, okay? That's, that's the essence of hydrodynamics. And so the correlation functions of conserved densities about thermal equilibrium are very strongly constrained. And a very nice classic paper on is this one by Kadanoff and Martin. So hydrodynamics holds at times later than the, something called the thermalization time. Okay? And so the idea is if you take your, your sample and you, you, you hit it, you do something to it, okay, it'll be out of equilibrium, a lot of crazy stuff will happen, and then what will happen is it will locally reach thermal equilibrium. So you'll, you'll locally establish a temperature at every point, but the temperatures won't be exactly the same. And then at much later times, after this thermalization time, heat will diffuse and it will establish global thermal equilibrium. Okay, so the hydrodynamics is this late time diffusive process that happens after you reach local thermal equilibrium. You have to have a notion of local temperature before temperature can diffuse, right? It doesn't make sense otherwise. Okay, so there's a separation of time scales. So hydrodynamics, by definition, is what happens after you reach local thermal equilibrium uh, at some time scale. Right, so at long times, the non-conserved quantities have all decayed, and all that's left is these conserved densities. However, the dynamics of these non-conserved quantities, the fast dynamics, it enters into hydrodynamics. Okay, uh, sorry. I should have done this before. The, dynam the, the microscopic dynamics enters, enters hydrodynamic through the so-called transport coefficient. So, for example, in the simplest case that we're going to be talking about, where let's say there's only one conserved quantity, energy or, or charge, it will diffuse, and all, the sh all of the short-distance physics goes into determining the diffusivity, which is the diffusion constant. So the form of this equation is determined by the late time, the, the structure of conserved quantities, but the value of this coefficient, d, is determined by microscopic dynamics. Okay? Very good, so that's hydrodynamics, okay. So, all right, so now I want, the objective is to bound the diffusivity, okay, because the diffusivity controls the conductivity. So, so we're gonna use causality. Now, causality, 
prior to 1970, the only people who cared about causality were, were relativists, okay, people studying special relativity, because in, as you all know, in special relativity, there's a light cone, there's a strong sense of causality that you can't propagate signals outside the light cone. So it turns out that non-relativistic lattice systems also have a light cone, and, and the, the velocity is called the Lee robinson velocity. And, and it goes like, so the, the statement is this one, that if I take an operator at time x and time t, its commutator with an operator at time zero and space zero is exponentially small if you're outside of a light cone, okay? And so this, 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 right, so this, is, a, this is a light cone, and this v is the, is the velocity of the light cone. And this velocity is called the Lee robinson velocity, I'll give you the formula in a second, but let's understand where it comes from because it's actually pretty simple. Okay, so these, these people are mathematical physicists and it all looks very complicated with these operator norms and so on, but the, physic, the physical intuition and in fact the proof is, is, is quite straightforward. All right, and so it goes like this. Here you have a lattice spacing A, so this is the lattice spacing, and imagine at time zero I start with an operator here. Okay, so maybe this is the spin Z component, S of Z, right? Some, some operator at this site, okay? And now I evolve it in time with a local Hamiltonian, right? So perhaps the Hamiltonian is something like SI Z, SI plus one Z, okay? And let's say I have the operator SX at site 20, whatever, okay? So when I commute, so how do, how do operators time evolve in the Heisenberg picture? Well, you have to commute them with the Hamiltonian. So if I commute this operator at site 20 with this Hamiltonian, I'm gonna get an operator at sites 19, 20, and 21, right? So the operator, as you, as you commute with a local Hamiltonian, the operator grows, okay? Does that, does that make sense? So if I take a local Hamiltonian, uh, the, the operator equation of motion, as time passes, time's going this way, every time you, at each dt, small interval of time, you commute the, the operator of the Hamiltonian, and if the Hamiltonian is local, the operator will start growing. And this, and essentially this is the light cone, okay? As time passes, the operator only grows the number of times you act with the Hamiltonian, and this defines the velocity. And what is the velocity? Well, it's set by dimensionalysis. It's the coupling J of the Hamiltonian times the spacing A divided by H bar, okay? So this is a Lee robinson velocity. Um, very good. Okay, so, so, and, and so you cannot, it's not, it's not as quite as strong a light cone as in, as in special relativity, but it's a light cone nonetheless, so if you do something here, up to an exponentially small tail, you can only influence stuff uh, inside a light cone. All right, now, what's one way that you might try to, yes? I'm sorry? It's not what? The velocity is not universal. It depends no, on the operator absolutely. you are this, computing. This is a microscopic velocity. And the energy, energy scale that are involved in the problem. Uh, it's a microscopic energy scale. Uh, so if you have multiple energy scales in the problem, how do oh, you fix this? Fantastic. Sorry. Th thank you. So, uh, very good. It's bounded by, you take, you take all possible couplings between neighboring sites and it's the biggest. You take like the local Hamiltonian that couples one site to the next one and it's the biggest eigenvalue of that Hamiltonian. So the biggest energy scale wins. Yeah, that, that's, because that's, that's what lets you go the fastest. Yeah, thank you. But absolutely, this is, it's a, it's a microscopic uh, velocity, yeah. It's not unreasonable to hope that this would not be too different from the Fermi velocity in, in many systems, but, but it, you're, you're totally right, yeah. yeah. Um, good. Uh, good, okay. So now, okay, so we're not allowed to go outside this light, we're not allowed to send signals outside this light cone, certainly not big signals. And so what's one way of sending a signal? Well, I, oh. I, I just wondered, you know, you, you wrote down with the, that's an exponential decay, why, why is it not T squared? I mean, you would have thought, based on knowledge of diffusion, that... No, there's no, there's no diffusion yet. What, what, I know uh, there's no diffusion, No, no, diffusion's but, coming. No, okay. so, so this is a, this is a, this is a linear, so I think what you're asking is why, yeah, no, this is what they proved. This is a, it, it's, this, it's this fact that, so it's essentially this picture that, that the Hamiltonian acts sort of linearly in time, and so the operator grows linearly in time. I mean, that's, it, it is a proof, and those are words, but, but, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, but it, indeed, indeed, this is the whole point. So one way I could send a signal to you is by standing here and making some ripples, and the ripples would diffuse out to you, okay? So how fast does diffusion go? It goes like the square root of t, right? In, in diffusion, 
the distance you travel is, goes like the square root of time, okay? So now we see that we're gonna have a problem. Uh, oh, it's uh, one over the lattice spacing, essentially. I, I can't hear, yeah. The Coulomb interactions will spoil this? Yes, picture? yes, absolutely, yes. I mean, they're screened in, 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 okay. in, in practice, but indeed, so, uh, very good. For power law tails, th essentially what you wanna do is think of the power law as, a, imagine it as sort of a, a sum of short range interactions of different lengths and with different strengths. And then you sort of have to replace this by a sum of, of of like, you know, as you go further and further away, and sometimes that converges, sometimes it doesn't, and, and so uh, it's tricky, yeah. But indeed, long range stuff is tricky, yeah, that, that's right. Uh, okay, so I try to send something, oh, before I get to diffusion. So most of the time, in, in most discussion of the Lee Robinson bound, it's treated, in, in spin systems, for example, it's treated synonymously with a spin wave velocity. And so it's obvious that, if, for example, if, you're, if your spins are ordered, and you have a spin wave that propagates ballistically, then the spin wave velocity had better be less than the Lee Robinson velocity. Okay, right, that, that's, that's clear. But now suppose you have a diffusive case. So diffusion propagate, sends things out. I can send you a signal in, in a square root of time like, like this. And so let's put this on the, on the space time diagram. Uh, so here's, here's time and space. This is our light cone. And this is the square root of t. All right? So at late times, you're fine. Diffusion is subliminal, if you like, okay? But at early times, diffusion is too fast. It takes you outside the light cone, all right? So is this bad? Does this mean diffusion doesn't exist? No, we should all be happy because I told you that diffusion is hydrodynamics, and that only happens at late times after you establish local thermal equilibrium. So for consistency with causality, T thermal had better be at least here. If, thermalization, if thermal equilibrium, local thermal equilibrium is established too quickly, then diffusion is too fast. But if you have to wait up to here before diffusion starts, then it's always subliminal, okay? So you do a simple thing. You take this picture. You, you put a line across here for T-thermal, and you require that it, it be above this point. Does that, that, does that make sense? Right, so, so let me do that again. We do this. We have two lines. We intersect them, and this point, T-intersection, should be less than T-thermal T -thermal equilibrium, okay? Simple. I like simple, like the more, the older I get, the more I like simple, simple arguments. But Chong, oh, sorry, uh, in order to get a diffusion, you need to couple your system uh, to something, uh, to a reservoir, a disorder, etc. No, no, so this, no, 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 no. Uh, so this is very good. Firstly, this diffusion, this is not a diffusive, so like with disorder, like the, the electron propagator actually becomes diffusive, which is not what I'm talking about. This is hydrodynamic diffusion. That the only things that diffuse are conserved quantities at late time and interactions are crucial. So, so um, you talk to me, it's sound. I say? When you talk to me. Oh, no, 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 but that's because there's energy uh, and number density, so there's not diffusion. Right, right, so, <laughs> fantastic. I'm, I'm, what I'm talking about now is the case where there's only one conserved quantity. When you have more than one, you get sound waves, and then, and then the right thing to think about is, is this, not in terms of diffusion. So I'm talking about, for example, camera and systems, insulator, maybe spins in a disordered, a disordered phase, uh, thermal transport in the insulator, charge transport if you can neglect thermoelectric effects. So diffusion happens when there's only one conserved quantity, scalar conserved quantity at late times. Very good, okay, so, so this is a naive argument which is, does have loopholes and so that's why I'm gonna give you a rigorous argument in, in a minute, okay? But this is the physical, the physical picture. And so this, this naive argument will tell you that the diffusivity is bounded above uh, by this Lee Robinson velocity squared and this thermalization time. Okay. All right. So, so uh, okay. And so this tells you that the diffusivity cannot be too fast given the thermalization time. And also, if you know the diffusivity, you can't thermalize too quickly. Okay. Uh, so, if we go ahead and apply this to electronic transport, neglecting thermoelectric effects. So, just think about charge. Uh, it bounds the resistivity. So, the resistivity is given by the Einstein relation. It's one over the susceptibility times the diffusivity. And so dropping all the other stuff, this bounds it by one over tau thermal. So I like to think of this as a, quote, generalized Judah formula in the sense that the Judah formula tells you that the resistivity is equal to one over tau, uh, you know, transport time. 
with, with some prefactors, of course. And what I'm saying is that without assuming the existence of quasi, without hardly assuming anything, there is still exists a relationship between a time scale and the resistivity, which the resistivity uh, is bounded below by this thermalization time. If I have a weakly coupled system, the thermalization time is in fact the transport lifetime. Okay, and this and this inequality actually becomes an equality. Okay, but more generally, there's still a relationship between transport and, and, and a time scale uh, that holds with or without quasi particles. Okay, so right, good. All right, so another way of saying that the fact that there is a time scale that controls the resistivity does not imply that there are quasi particles because it's a more general thing. Okay. Uh, and also, you see, for example, in this formula, if this time scale starts getting very short, so the thermalization starts getting faster and faster, for example, at high temperatures, the resistivity is necessarily pushed up, and you necessarily get a bad metal. Okay. All right. So uh, for people who, there are loopholes in what I just said. And so uh, we, we finally, mainly actually, my, my student, Gigi, actually managed to, to prove a version of this. And I, I, I very quickly want to give the outline of how, of how it works, because I think it's interesting. Okay, so it, I would call it a heuristic argument, what I just gave you, and, and here's a sort of proof. Of course, to prove something, we had to be a little bit more restrictive, uh, so let me very quickly tell you how this worked. So, the, right, so thermal equilibrium is a very complicated, uh, complicated place. Uh, a simplification of it is in so-called uh, Limbladian dynamics, where you basically imagine integrating out the thermalizing bath and just focus on some subset. Of, so you imagine you have some electrons, the electrons are coupled to some phonons, and you just trace out the phonons, and, and the role of the phonons is they give you decoherence of the electrons, okay? And you just look at the electron system. The Schrodinger equation is replaced by the Limblad equation, uh, and, so, and, in, so the, and the Heisenberg equation is replaced like this. So some operator, O dot, is what it would be, okay? This would be the Heisenberg, the normal thing. But now you have these Ls, which are these decoherence operators, okay? And so what this equation is, is it's the most general equation. Uh, so in particular, you could evolve the density matrix like this. It's the most general equation that is first order in time, linear, and preserves the, positivity, the complete positivity of the density matrix. Okay, because, so in quantum mechanics, right, the Schrodinger equation is unitary because you want to preserve, you want to preserve the norm of the states. Okay? But actually in an open quantum system, there's a generalization of that, which is you want to preserve the trace and the positivity of the density matrix. It's a slightly weaker assumption, and this is the version of the Schrodinger equation that applies in that context of an open quantum system. It's simpler than a thermal state because typically if you integrate out the phonons, the phonons are going to have a lot of time scales, and it's going to make the effective electron dynamics non-local in time. And the Limbad equation throws that away with this so-called Markovian property, which is that it's first order in time. Now, another nice thing about this Limblad dynamics is that in, in, in a unitary evolution in a thermal state, of course, norms are preserved, okay? And oh, so diffusion was something you'd see at the level of expectation values, like the expectation value of the charge would diffuse. Uh, but actually, in these Limbadian dynamics, the whole operator just decays. So diffusion can arise as an operator equation in Limbadian dynamics, so it's simpler. Um, yeah, I don't know how much detail I want to go into, but the idea, but basically, there's, there's going to be an operator, C of k, which is the, 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 k, the um, fluctuations of the charge on wavelength k that obeys an operator equation, which is going to be diffusion. And by doing, by doing sort of perturbation theory in small k, we got a formula for d. Yeah, I think I'm just going to flash this, okay? So for people, yeah. Um, so the, we got a formula for D, we calculated in the XXZ model, uh, with some simple model, and it agrees very nicely with previous calculations, so it's correct. Mm. Um, let's see, how might, let me, uh, do I wanna, yeah, I think I'm, I'm gonna maybe, yeah, maybe I, I want to get to the next point, so I'm gonna go through this very quickly. Yes? Uh, not with dephasing, Th thank you, sorry. So this is the XXZ model with on-site dephasing. Which, 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 which is diffusive, yeah. yeah. Yes, he, he was uh, the, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, the question slash complaint was that the XXZ model is integrable, um, uh, but this is a X model with this on-site dephasing, so you imagine you've coupled it to some phonons, 
and, and then it, it, it has diffusion. Yeah. And actually, this has been studied by, 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 by Prozen and, and uh, collaborators in, in Slovenia, and um, we, we reproduced their results. So. So, okay, it turns out as a formula for diffusivity, we do various mathematical steps, and you use the Robinson bound, um, and, and we, we prove the bound of diffusivity. I, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. An interesting thing happens, so this is, the lesson is that it's good to do rigorous arguments, because in fact, the bound changed a little bit. So there was, the diffusivity is, has, is, has to, is bounded by this time scale and, and these velocities, but there's actually a sort of a constant shift by this quantity zeta, which is the range of the interactions. Okay, so the bounds that we had before, the sort of heuristic bounds, the diffusivity was less than some velocity squared times this thermalization time. But in fact, there's an additive contribution that goes like a velocity times uh, the range of the interaction. This is a microscopic range. So this is probably like A, okay? And that's quite interesting because what that means, what this bound allows, is that if you imagine increasing temperature, this thing presumably gets shorter with the, the length, it get, things get faster at high temperature, but there's, there'll be this microscopic length scale, and when you go above that, it'll, the bound becomes this, and so it, it allows this region, so this is resistivity, which is one over diffusivity, I'm sorry, and so what, what this term actually does is it actually allows uh, resistivity saturation. Okay. Um, all right. um, I'm sorry I went through that quickly. The main takeaway message was that you can put some meat behind this heuristic picture. Okay. And if people are interested in Bladian dynamics, I'm happy to say more about it. So I want to spend the last uh, five or 10 minutes uh, talking about now something a bit different, uh, which is a, a microscopic model of bad metals with, with diffusion. And this was with uh, my student, uh, Colin Musatov, and Ilya Steris, who's a student of uh, Steve Kivosens. All right, and so again, the idea is to study diffusion in a bad metal uh, where we can actually calculate things uh, properly. And so let me make the, so we start with the following observation. So. A good candidate for a bad metal would be a strongly correlated, let's say, 2D Hubbard model where U is much bigger than T. And the first thing that would come to your mind, and in fact did come to people's mind in the 70s, is that maybe you could do perturbation theory in little t. However, that's a very bad idea because in the Hubbard model, if you set little t to zero, the interactions are purely on site, okay? And so each electron just doesn't even know about all the other electrons. And so the spectrum is massively degenerate, okay? It has an extensive degeneracy, does that, does that make sense? If I turn off the hopping term, but there's only an on-site interaction, I mean, yeah, this is, there's an extensive degeneracy and perturbation theory about that state is, is essentially impossible, okay? You're, you're, everything will be infinite. All right, now, however, let's, uh, there's a simple thing you can do, which is, I guess, to undo probably what, what Mott, uh, sorry, Hubbard uh, wanted to do originally. So of course, this on-site interaction is an idealization. It's not what actually happens. What actually happens is maybe that there's an exponential interaction between sites, okay? So the first point that did surprise me a few months ago, but maybe it's not surprising in retrospect, that an exponentially decaying interaction with a very short range, okay? A range, let's say if the lattice spacing is one, the range only has to be like two lattice sites is enough to completely lift the extensive degeneracy and give you a continuous spectrum. Okay, so I could, so as a physicist you would say, what possible difference could there be between an exponential interaction with range two, okay, and the on-site and maybe a next to nearest term, okay? Well, mathematically, there's a huge difference, okay? That if you keep to purely a finite range interaction, the t equals zero model will be, always be extensively degenerate. An exponentially short range interaction is not degenerate, okay? And, and you can just prove that, yes. Must be degeneracy associated with spin if you're... Uh, yeah, yeah, of, co of course, uh, absolutely. Yes, 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 but it's not ex that's not extensive in space. Uh, I think, uh, it, it, it's totally right that, that sorry. It, uh, uh, 
Yeah, this doesn't mess things up for what I'm doing. Yes, yeah, you're, you're totally right, of course. You could, this, this, but I mean, you could trivially lift that, right, by, by uh, coupling spins, right? But, but yeah, of course, yeah, this doesn't lift any spin. Spins are gonna be quite inert in everything I'm about to say, yeah. Uh, so, Sean, Sean, uh, yeah, yes, the, the question was, are we gonna take U and V or just keep V? So, uh, just to be as convincing as possible, what we did is took both, and furthermore, we took V to be one-tenth of U. So that it's a small, relatively small perturbation of the Hubbard model. But, but uh, obviously, the V, this includes, well, actually, we separated out the U, but I mean, it's not very important, yeah. So, but indeed, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna take V to be 0 0.1 times U. Just make it a small effect. Okay, but so just, again, you know, the Hubbard model is supposed to make life easier, okay, by, by putting an on-site interaction. But if you wanna do small T perturbation theory, the Hubbard model makes life harder than, than it would have been with a exponentially short-ranged interaction, okay? So, so that's just a technical point. So, and, and we, so you, yeah, we can prove that this thing has a continuous spectrum. It, it's not difficult when, when L's two. Okay, so let's take L to be two. And so now we can just take this model and start doing small t perturbation theory on it. And the nice thing is, that, so the t equals zero model, it's a bit complicated, but you can find, you can solve it by doing classical Monte Carlo because all of these terms uh, commute, okay? And classical Monte Carlo is essentially trivial. Okay, I mean, you know, you can, you put it on the computer, you put it on your laptop, and you do it, okay? It's not quantum Monte Carlo, it, it's, it's, it's doable. All right, and in particular, you can start calculating the conductivity. So, so again, you can do classical Monte Carlo um, in small t perturbation theory. So you can just derive this formula for the conductivity. So what is it? It has a t squared, because the current operator has a t in front, okay? And then, but when you calculate the expectation value, then you just put t equals zero, because you're doing perturbation theory. And so you have a sum over configurations of, of, of occupation numbers with a Boltzmann weight. And then the conductivity is given by some spectral weight, which is basically how many ways can you hop from one site to the next site such that the total energy change is omega, okay? And you sum over all of those, and that's your conductivity, all right? So you do classical Monte Carlo, you generate configurations like this. So this is like zero, one, or two, right? The, 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 the guys on the site. This is now the energy, right? Because the energy has this on-site term, but also this long-range term, all right? So, this, so you sort of see there are two Hubbard bands, there's an upper band and a lower Hubbard band, but now they're smoothed out, right? They're, 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 they're smoothed out by, by this long-range interaction. And then you do the sum, and this is your Druder peak, except that it's Gaussian, um, as I'll explain in a second. And this is the optical connectivity over a wider range. So there's some Hubbard bands, which have been smoothed, and there's this interaction. Of course, in the full Hubbard model, the Hubbard bands are smoothed, but you have to work non-perturbatively in, in little t to see that. Here we can work perturbatively in little t, and the V interaction smooths out everything for you. Okay, that, that's the, the name of the game. And uh, of course, we have to be at high temperature. Okay, there's a cost to doing this, which is that everything has to be bigger than little t, so that includes the temperature. Okay, so the temperature doesn't have to be big compared to U or V, but it does have to be big compared to little t. So this is not in your degenerate, you know, it's not quite where you want to be, but this is what you can do easily. All right. So you just calculate it, and you, you run a computer, and you, 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 you can uh, calculate conductivities, uh, resistivities. How am I doing for time? Am I out of time? One minute, okay. <laughs> All right, so there's, there's a nice T-linear resistivity-ish. Uh, you can calculate time scales and so on. So uh, let me very quickly say a few. The whole point of having solvable models, or quasi, you know, I think classical Monte Carlo is essentially solvable as far as I'm uh, concerned. So, so is to get some intuition for what's happening. Okay. So, so uh, this is a very bad metal. Okay. The resistivity is this is, this is a U over T here, and so T is much less than U. So this, this is a super high resistivity. What happens essentially is that you get this is like the on-site energy. Okay. So there's basically an emergent there's an emergent disordered landscape due to the interactions, okay? So, so there's no, there was no disorder in this problem, but this is a typical configuration, and as you can see, it's quite disordered. And so essentially what's happening is electrons are hopping around in, in this very disordered configuration. And because of this hierarchy of scales, the landscape doesn't change 
the current decays more quickly than the landscape changes. So it's a lot, it, it becomes a lot like a disordered problem, which you could then worry about localization, but I don't have time uh, to talk about it. Uh, so you just go ahead and calculate for it. So, so this telangiectivity in this range actually it doesn't come from the, this is the lifetime, the, uh, the width of the Judah peak, okay? Defines a, a, a thermalization time. And actually it doesn't, it, it, it changes by a factor of two, but it, it doesn't change very much. What, what's driving the telinear resistivity is actually the, the Judah weight, the spectral weight transfer. And that's reasonable because we're at very high, temp we're at high temperatures. But we're not at super high temperatures, okay? There's like, there's again, the sort of trivial regime when T is much bigger than U, then that's just, everything's completely classical. So we're not quite that high, okay? T is small compared to U, but it's, it's not degenerate. Uh, I think it'll be one more minute, it's just be one. This, this, uh, this linear, this resistivity is, is not exactly linear, but approximately linear, it's quite smooth, but actually if you look at the diffusivity, it actually shows a crossover at, at, at uh, U from being constant in the high temperature regime to having some temperature dependence here. Um, and this doesn't come from the lifetime, it actually comes from a temperature dependent velocity, which is related to the spectral weight changing with temperature, right? The, the spectral weight's like the kinetic energy, which defines a velocity, which is temperature dependent. So this is, Again, we're at temperatures much above T, so this is not what is happening you know, in most of the metals that you care about, uh, but it's a model for bad metal transport. And curiously, uh, it's too high temperature for metals, but it's not too high a temperature for cold atoms, which as hopefully you all know, are not that cold, okay, in absolute, uh, absolute units. And so more or less in parallel with our paper, this is, this is supposed to be a cold atom realization of the Hubbard model, with U of basically 8T. And so this is almost exactly the same temperature range that we're looking at, okay? Um, of course, our T is much smaller. Um, and it, so look, the diffu unfortunately, they didn't plot one over the diffusivity. But this, if you, if you take one over this, okay, it really looks like, it looks like that. Uh, and this is the susceptibility. If you plot one over that, it really looks like, it looks like this, okay? And so here you see that the diffusivity has a temperature dependence, but the resistivity is actually fairly, fairly doesn't have this feature, okay? So there's an interesting thing which seems to be happening, which is that in this case, the T-linear resistivity sort of masks a non-trivial change in behavior that happens at this scale U. Actually, similar things from Juan Monte Carlo that I will not talk about. Oh, and just to connect, also vitamin Franz is super violated. Uh, in this regime, these are high temperatures, so you, you don't expect vitamin friends to be true, okay? However, L0, the Sommerfeld value, is still a rather useful ballpark, and you can get L much, much less than L0 uh, in, this, in this high temperature uh, regime. Um, that, that's this plot. And actually, possibly connected with uh, something observed in VO2. All right, I'll, I'll just stop there. Yeah.